<laughs> Hi, this is Annabelle. You may recognize her from The Conjuring, her spin-off movies, or from your own nightmares. But I recognize Annabelle as something else. Racist. Now you might be saying, Daniel, it's just a doll. How can something like this be that evil? To which I say, have you seen the movie? Because I have. And what I learned is, you have to look closer. Closer? Sorry. Thank you. You see, this is also Annabelle, the movie from 2014. And this Annabelle is racist. So let's talk about Annabelle is about a young couple expecting their first child. After Mia receives the Annabelle doll as a gift, she witnesses a cult-driven murder that connects the doll to a demonic presence. Trying for a change of scenery, she moves with her husband and her new baby, and it's there that she meets Evelyn. But the hauntings continue, including this really cool elevator scene. As Mia continues to deal with these supernatural happenings, she learns what the demon wants through Evelyn's spiritual insight. A soul and they won't stop until they get one. Knowing that Mia will do anything for her child, the demon tries to trick Mia into giving up her own life for the babies. But right before Mia jumps, her husband saves her, and Evelyn instead grabs the Annabelle doll and sacrifices herself so that Mia and her family can live happily ever after. But there's one thing preventing us from being happy with them. Annabelle's still <laughs> out there. Also, Evelyn's character fulfills every criteria for a racist trope that you might be familiar with. You see, back in the early 2000s, multiple films hit blockbuster shelves that all followed the same trope. This trope, according to film critic Matt Zoller Seitz, is a saintly African-American character who often seems to have an uncanny ability to say and do exactly what needs to be said or done in order to keep the story chugging along in the white hero's favor. While on a lecture tour, Spike Lee spoke derisively about this trope and repopularized its name, dubbing it the super duper magical I'm not saying that. I know that's the correct academic term for this phenomena, but me saying it would be sort of like Oh my lucky stars, a negro. Say what? Science fiction writer Nadima Okorafor, discussing Stephen King's use of the trope, defines it with five characteristics. So let's take a look at what her five criteria are and if Evelyn fulfills all five. Number one, she is a person of color in a story about predominantly white characters. One moment, let me just, let me just check. Yes, Evelyn is a person of color and let me see white, white, very white. Yeah, I think this checks out. Number two, she seems to have nothing better to do than to help the white protagonist who is often a stranger at first. Evelyn shows up around minute 37 when the couple have just moved into their new apartment. At minute 44, she speaks for the first time. Hey. Introducing herself to Mia, which means that they're strangers. And then she also unprompted gives a book to their daughter. Here, maybe Mia will like it too when she's a little older. Oh. In the next scene, she meets the husband. Thank you for the book. And tells them. I couldn't help myself. Yeah, because the filmmakers gave you nothing to do except help these two people. Number three, she is uneducated, mentally handicapped, at a low position in life, or all of the above. Number four, she is wise, patient, and spiritually in touch. Now Evelyn is educated, not mentally handicapped, and seems to be well off financially, but she is in a low place emotionally. While Evelyn assists Mia with her problem, we learn that Evelyn's daughter died in a car crash while Evelyn was driving. We don't know how long ago this was, but we do know it affected her so much that Evelyn wanted to... Without her, I felt like I had nothing else to live for, so... She wanted to do that until... I heard her voice. She told me that God had another purpose for me. Which means Evelyn fulfills these two criteria. She's at an emotional low, or she once was, and the only thing that keeps her going is the belief that God has a special purpose for her. A purpose will learn once the demon makes its move. This is what Ruby meant. Evelyn, no, no. Number five, she disappears, dies, or sacrifices something of great value, helping the white protagonist. The final criteria is fulfilled just with how Annabelle ends. But if we just focus on the fact that she dies, we're gonna miss the fact that she also loses something very important. A soul. Evelyn informed Mia earlier that the demon is after a soul. But a soul cannot just be taken. A soul needs to be offered to the demon before it can take it. The demon's plan is to get Mia to offer her soul in exchange for her babies, even though the demon can't take 
the baby's soul because the baby cannot offer it. It's a trick. But we're giving no acknowledgement of that fact after Evelyn offers her soul. A core four tells us that in this trope, when the person of color dies, the audience is not expected to feel great sadness at a magical Negro's passing. The audience is meant to be a little sad, but then quickly turn to see what the main character will next do. Our protagonist is joyful. She's rid of the evils of Annabelle and the camera even tilts up to heaven and starts to fade to white, which is maybe not the color I'd be fading to right now, especially when your only black character has been serving the white character the entire movie and then sacrifices herself for the white character's happiness, even if it means sacrificing her soul according to the will of God. How did something so vile, outdated, and poorly conceived get released by a major studio? No one could possibly write something this tone deaf. And the thing is, no one did. Because I found the screenplay for Annabelle, and Evelyn's not in it. At the same point in the movie when Evelyn would be introduced, in the screenplay, the apartment landlord named Fuller is introduced. He also dies in the third act, but not through self-sacrifice. He dies in an elevator which would feel kind of redundant to the elevator scene from earlier in the movie until you check the screenplay and discover that the elevator scene isn't in it either. This draft, dated October 7th, 2013, is filled with plot threads that are altogether dropped from the final movie. The couple struggle in their marriage. The bookstore owner is a completely separate character, and this joke is different. We can turn the whole room into your own little sweatshop. It's kind of weird. But one of the biggest differences is that Mia sacrifices herself at the end of the script for her baby, not Evelyn. The demon unquestionably wins at the end by exploiting Mia's motherly love. The main theme of the screenplay is motherhood, and that remains in the final edit. Mothers are closer to God than any other living creature, for only they can share in God's created miracle. And the motherly sacrifice ending of the script makes sense with this theme, as well as in the broader Conjuring universe. Demons like to mock what is sacred, which is why they knock three times in the Conjuring. It's why they possess image bearers of God. It's why the nun is... a nun. An unusually attractive nun is causing mayhem in the- Since we know motherhood is so close to the heart of God, it makes sense that a demon would try to pervert a mother's godly desire to protect her child in order to damn an image bearer of God. And although Evelyn's backstory does tie back to the theme of motherhood, she's not being exploited by a demon. It's the opposite. She's being told to by God. She told me that God had another purpose for me. This is what Ruby meant. So based on reading the screenplay, what I think happened is that some person in power over this movie decided the ending was a downer, saw the opportunity to cast Alfre Woodard, combine two speaking characters into one, and synthesizing all these elements together, tapped into the racist trope that we're now really familiar with. Because that's the problem with tropes. They're like possessed dolls. Even if you think you toss them out of the house, they always find their way back in. We've all seen films with one of these magical black characters. You might even like some of them. I know I want to cry by the end of the Green Mile. And because we've all seen movies like this, it appears in movies like Annabelle. It's an easy story to replicate and it's seen success. But some of you still might be wondering, why is this trope so bad? Literary professor Audrey Colombe states, The figuration of the magical character is part of a larger structure that works to fit persons of color into white narratives. So what cultural thought does the magical black character echo? Filmmaker Sidney Cusick, writing on Uncle Tom's Cabin and the Green Mile, argues, Christianity gave whites the protection they needed to keep black people from inflicting the violence back on them. The Uncle Tom character type evolved into the magical black person. Jesus said, greater love hath no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. I don't believe that anybody who worked on Annabelle is racist. I think they pulled from old story tropes and cultural assumptions unconsciously. Annabelle was made for $6.5 million in 25 days. There's an adage that says there's a triangle to quality. It could be two of the three. Cheap, fast, well-made. And Annabelle sacrificed the quality of being well-made in order to be made quickly and for only a little bit of money. 
And while I don't put the blame for the Evelyn thing on any one person who worked on Annabelle, I would like to offer a word of caution to James Wan. Now, James Wan is one of my favorite filmmakers, but his work as a producer highlights the problem of creating horror films so quickly and cheaply. There's a cross-dressing villain in Insidious Chapter 2, there's another problematic self-sacrifice at the end of Lights Out, and The Curse of La Llorona starring Linda Cardinelli stars Linda Cardinelli instead of a Mexican actress. I like a lot of these cheap horror movies, but the problem with the production limits of these movies means that they go for tried and true tropes that honestly should have just been left in the past. Just like Annabelle should be left outside.